an East Tolua Lugua Bola, um, by privilege, the lead pastor of his Worship Christian Network, headquartered in Obomosha. I was fortunate to be born into a Christian home, and then um, I used the word Christian very carefully. Yes, I, I, I mean a home that um, had its principles in Christ. And um, I've loved him since I was born. Um, my first attempt at ministry was because somebody found out that I could sing. I still do. And so I was conscripted into a choir at the age of six. Um, I was like the lead singer in the choir. So that was basically what I did until about age nine when I consciously gave my life to Christ. And um, I found out that there was more to my work with the Lord. I began to experience a strange affection towards scriptures and then the place of prayer, which was something I had come into since like age five. And I started praying consciously at age five because um, my ages three and four um, were very stormy. Actually, by my first birthday, I was hospitalized for a long time. Um, but by age three and four, I regularly had these, these dreams of um, certain creatures coming to oppress me. And the oppressions were not just spiritual. Even if I opened my eyes, I saw the physical creatures. And I remember that every night I would run to my parents' room and then my dad and mom would lay hands on me and pray. But into the morning of my fifth birthday, I had a lot of struggles. It was a snake, it was a dog. And I knocked the door of their room. They were praying in a language I barely could understand, but the door was not opened. And so when we came to devotion in the morning and began to pray, um, and then they sang the happy birthday song, I was sad because I felt I was no longer accepted. You didn't come to my aid. And my dad looked at me and said, in whose name have we been praying for you? I said, the name of Jesus. And he looked at me squarely in the eyes and said, if you don't start praying, you will not see your 60th birthday. So prayer for me became... Um, not something that I do because I needed a need to be met. It became survival for me. It still is. Um, so that's how I continued in my journey. I had a few leadership roles in church, but my, the demands on me became stronger when I moved into my secondary school. It was as though people saw that there was something about me that I didn't see. So I had to commit myself into a lot of study we didn't have a chaplain on campus at that time, so I had to act as a student. I was the social prefect of the school, but I was also doubling as the preacher in the school. Um, so all of that led on until the Lord began to invite me to the discovery of purpose and invited me to pray about three hours every night. I did that for a little over nine months. And then on one of those nights, he visited me with a set of visions and those visions form the core of what we do as a ministry now. Um, that moved me into the university. And in the university, I had plans to just be there, just run around until we began to experience an event on our campus when in two weeks we lost 50 students. And um, it was my induction into territorial intercession when the Lord began to speak to me that if I do not raise the campus to pray, then the next person's blood will be on my head. So we had to put together a prayer group. And then as I began to yield in obedience to every step, progressively, um, I graduated, served in my degree. I was a lot with the camp, with the Coppers Fellowship. Ultimately, I found myself in Lagos. When I came into campus, I was with NIFES. It was not the major um, fellowship on campus. The strongest campus fellowship was FCS. Um, but we didn't have a standard Christian body on campus. Everybody was just doing their thing. I felt that it was one of my assignments to unify the body of Christ on campus based on my perspective of a territorial church. So after the event, we had an event when we lost our students and then Jesus had to hang that on my head. Even at that time, I couldn't pray in tongues for 10 minutes. So I was the chief usher on that prayer night instead of the one leading the prayers. 
After the prayers, I was invited to come and round up. And the only thing that crossed my heart was a, a line, thank you. So I told them what the Lord just told me to tell them was thank you. And I moved on. Um, but how, after that time, the Lord became more intentional. And that's how the prayer group was formed. It was supposed to be an FCS 100 level fellowship. But some of us just felt the need to join. So after a while, it metamorphosed into about nine or ten campus fellowships. And then after 100 level, everybody had at least one F in their results. So um, it dissolved and then we became 50. But it was a vibrant 50. Like I said, I was the least of the 50. So I had to watch them pray. I had to listen to their tongues. Most of their tongue sessions were recorded on audio cassettes for me. So I had to listen again and again, and I used that to drive my prayers. But as we began to progress on campus, some brothers left with sisters, some sisters left with brothers, um, others became more focused. We had our own share of feedbacks on campus, very strong, um, until we became two. And then eventually I became the only one. And for another three sessions, I was the only one that kept those watches. It was 9 p.m. to 12 p.m. every night. And I was the only one praying. Um, there are the other two, there is one who is a pastor in Kaduna. Another one is a reading pastor in Abuja. But the others have, uh, um, well, maybe they still attend churches, but there's nothing vibrant coming out of the group again. So we had quite a lot to discourage us and um, a lot of people fell for the discouragement. Towards the end of the year 1999, I was in, that's my penultimate year in secondary school, that's what we call the SS2. Um, I, I felt the Lord ask me one night to come to prayers. We were all trying to label around what to study in the university, hoping that that would have a strong bearing on our future. Um, my daddy has a private mission hospital, and so I looked like the one to inherit it, so it was medicine all the way. But I perceived the Lord speaking to me about engineering. And so my confusion led me to say yes to the prayers. As at that time, I really couldn't pray in tongues. So I had to fulfill that prayer demand, praying in English for three hours every night, for over nine months. Um, on the final day, now after the first day he spoke to me, I didn't hear the Lord speak to me again. So there were really no prayer points beyond purpose. After the first week, I had exhausted all that I knew. So I felt that the Lord wanted to use my prayer time to achieve other things. So anything that crossed my mind in prayers, I prayed. Um, but about five months down the line, the subject of my intercession that night was witchcraft. And in the middle of the prayers, we had a power outage. Actually, what I felt was that the witches had come for me. Uh, but in the middle of my experience, I, I, I saw a student bring a rechargeable lamp to me and dropped it and left. He was one of the most notorious boys in school. So when I saw him in the morning, he said the Lord woke him up and told him that I was afraid. So he brought the lamp, dropped it. And that was for me um, the validation of my labor. That it means God is not speaking, but his eyes are still on me. Um, after nine months and five days thereabout, as I was going back at 3 a.m., because it was 12 to 3 a.m., I heard the Lord say, don't come tomorrow. And at this point, I had already lost touch with looking for purpose. I just enjoyed prayers, but I still could not pray in tongues. And so I slept into that night, and I had a dream. It was that I was on a queue. I don't know where we're going to, but there was a branding that was going on on our backs. And that branding was to bring us into a kind of life. I heard my name called. My first name is not Tolua Lugu. My first name is Ulua Kwelumi. Yes, but in the dream, it was my second name that was called. So after I woke from the dream, I decided to adopt my second name instead of my first name. So I, I um, came into a house, ran into a house, and then I met one who I came to know as the Lord, and two angelic beings, even though they all look like human beings. And in the few hours in the dream, I was shown about seven days, seven earth days, in about six hours. And each of those days, I was to learn something different about the church. 
I was to learn how the enemy will appear in church. I learned music in the church. I learned prayers. I learned how to detect errors in study. Um, quite a few other things. But my final day was what gave birth to ministry. Because it was a Sunday morning and when we walked into that church building, it was empty. And I was asking the Lord what, what happened on a Sunday morning. And he told me when he views the church, his perspective on Sunday mornings is most times an empty church. So he began to speak from John chapter 4, how that the Father seeketh such who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And that many times those who come to church don't come in that mood, so they are marked absent. It was after he made that statement, he spoke to me and said, I'm sending you back to teach my church the patterns of true worship and then raise me an army. So that's why the name of our ministry, his, his worship, Christian, it used to be center, but in registering we became a network. And then um, that's the dream. So my first six years were near accurate years. I think when I entered secondary school and we mingled with a larger community because we were raised in isolation. We didn't have too many friends. We rarely had visitors. And if we had visitors, they were missionary kids like we were. But getting into a secondary school, um, now we didn't watch movies when we were small. We only had educative children's programs and then Christian movies. Now we had to watch whatever that person was watching. So um, part of those consecrations became eroded. And um, it was fine until I appeared in my fourth, my third secondary school, I was in three secondary schools, and then I really wanted to be like every other person. I know there was this tug that was there in my heart, um, but I still just wanted to be like every other person. I didn't travel too far in a way, no serious wrongdoings, but I know that I reneged on certain things. Um, what I will call my, 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 my departure time was when I came back from youth service, and then my dad would want me to start immediately in Obumo show and I wanted to go to Lagos. So I got an oil and gas job. I was a plant design engineer and I earned quite a lot. Um, I started trading forex that time too and um, I was a master. So um, I, I could make eight, nine thousand US dollars that time in one day, sometimes in less than two hours. And so I had many friends who were bankers. You know, every lady in the bank wanted me to bankroll them and do all of that. And so I, I knew it was a total departure. I started doing things that I would normally not want to do, hang out with the wrong people. And um, God had to do something major in um, making me fall into the hands of a few people who duped me here and there, lost some money trading. And then um, I began to beg on the streets of Lagos. And then his sound came again and he told me, you get back to Bumosho. I didn't want to, so I had to get investors. And then um, as a 2010, um, um, I woke up one day and found out I was owing like 33 million. So um, this was investor funds. Um, I tried to take a loan in the bank. My credit rating had dropped. So I, I got arrested. And um, I had to stay one night in a police cell, um, but my dad called the next morning and told me, well, he's, he's not too wealthy, but that he had saved up a little amount of money over the last two years and was going to will, be willing to pay in tranches for my release if I was going to go to Bumosho for ministry. At that point, I had gotten to the end of the rope, so I told the Lord, just get me out of this cell, and he did. So a week later, I relocated to Bumosho and um, got a teaching job, which was the most stressful, um, the most expensive private school teaching job I got in the Boomer Show was 13000 So I had to live on 13000 monthly for two years, and it was hell. It was hell. Many times when the salaries are collected, the other teachers are rejoicing, and I'm thinking, how do you spend 13000 It was about my week's phone bills in Lagos. I was not even on a prepaid line, I was on a postpaid line. So I had to learn how to load recharge cards. I had to learn how to wear what was available because in trying to get out of my debts, I used to be a wristwatch freak. So I sold a lot, sold shoes, sold suits, 
Now I was without I dressed like a normal secondary school teacher. <laughs> but it was um, it was my turning point. One of those nights I had to ask the Lord, why am I here? And what he said to me, I remember clearly. He said, I took you away from the city. I took you away from the noise so that you could be close to me. It was in those moments I began to, to labor again um, for revival. And then he told me it was time to start ministry. Based on my visions from the Lord and the subsequent um, encounters I had that gave expression to the nine mandates that we sit on, on the 3rd of February, 2013, I felt the Lord um, tell me to start. We started with about um, four, about six members. Um, all we just did was to meet, pray. Um, I preached and then um, we sang and we went home because there were only th three tools of ministry that he gave us. So there are many functional units in the average church that we don't have. It's just, he just told me, pray, with intensity, worship deeply, and then teach the word. So those are the only three things that we do as a ministry. Um, it started around students. We're still about um, 80 to 85% students. So it's, um, it's, not a, it's, it's more like an apostolic ministry and it's more apostolic because we have to labor quickly for five years to send the next set of people. But God has been faithful, God has been faithful. We didn't have much of a pattern when we started. We we're just zealous young ones who were trying to obedient, be obedient. But um, when I began to listen to my spiritual father, the Apostle Arome, I began to find a lot more traction as to how to run that kind of ministry. We don't have too many models. And then um, many times we, we look crazy because of the kind of things that we do. Our gospel is not attractive because apart from the fact that it has retained its primitive expressions, it's largely corrective. So um, it it's doesn't appeal to the average person. We became loved when God started opening the gates of power to us as a ministry. So at least they don't like what we say, but they don't doubt that we have uh, a lot of spiritual um, things to fly with. So alignment has been very difficult um, for, for somebody like me, who started with a 13,000 Naira per month salary into ministry, at that time, we had only five meetings in a month, and um, we're paying like a thousand, like 500 Naira per hour. Many months we couldn't even pay. So we had to beg into the next month. So financing initially was um, a lot of problems, but we, we stayed, we stayed, and I can acknowledge that it was mercy that kept us going. There were a lot of options to veer off and do a lot of other things. Um, but things are better now, things are better now. So now the challenge is sustaining alignment, but we are not without help. I found out that now to be misaligned is more difficult because I have to explain that to a lot of people. People have given up so much to be part of what Jesus is doing. And so to walk away, I'll have to tell them, I stopped hearing God. So um, staying is, is, is easier than walking away now. Uh, we're still not too large a ministry. We're just about 300 members. Um, but God has made us do more than what 300 people can do. You know, um, the average age of membership is still about 22, 23. But in nine years, we've raised a lot of wild people and it excites me. One of the things I've found out that will be a foundation for my admonition is that our ages do not really, um, are not a strong calibration for what God wants to do with us. I read scriptures and I saw what Jesus was doing at 12. I saw the King Josiah I saw what Joseph stood for when he was very young. And so, um, yes, there's a lot that a young person will lose in quotes if you enter into this path very early, but it's worth it. I've, 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 seen, I've seen regions being brought down by um, very young people. I, I was sharing somewhere this morning how that um, ahead of prayer, is about 21 years old. 
Yes, that's the one who, who, who champions our prayer team, a young lady. Um, <laughs> and um, I watch them pray. The intensity is high, the sight in the spirit is high, and their choice for consecration was early. So they are, they are more in a posture of advantage than we were. They didn't make the mistakes that we made. It was straight from secondary school into the army, and uh, I'm, I'm awed with what they, what they are doing. So what will move the nation forward, not just the nation but the church, is an army of young people. And God is desperate to bring them in very young, 16, 17. That's, I got the vision for the ministry at age 18. And I can, I can literally bring back all of the narratives of the vision that early. And I actually feel I came in a little bit late. So it means God is out earlier for young people. And if they throw themselves at him, there's no limit to which he can do with them.